Gonzo Education, Chapter 10, Part 4. I was never happier to see Michael than when he got out of the research facility. I was waiting for him by his car. The first thing we did was drive to a cheap motel. Michael paid for the room and I must have slept for two days straight. I kept working at 7-Eleven while we stayed there. I get off of work at 6 in the morning, take a two-hour bus ride across town to the motel, get in bed, and, turn it and fall asleep to Turner Classic Movies. We stayed at the Crackhead Motel for two weeks before their junkies got to be too much. Every night we'd get knocks on our doors. We'd get knocks from people looking for the previous resident. He must have been a drug dealer or a really popular guy because we'd have people banging at all hours. Another reason we left was because Michael finally convinced his boss at Domino's to let him have the keys so he could sleep inside their kitchen. His boss wanted to help, but Michael didn't tell him about his plan to sneak me inside the back door when his co-workers left for the night. The first night I was supposed to sleep there, I waited for Michael in the alley behind the store. I thought it'd be a nice spot, but hoodlums with spray cape, hoodlums with spray paint cans came up in the middle of the night wondering what I was doing, what I was doing there. One of the guys asked me for a cigarette. I was about to hand him one and he tried to grab the whole pack. Michael opened the back door to the pizza place just in time and I sco scooted inside and, and he quickly shut the door behind me. The hoodlum scurried away, spray paint cans rattling in the distance. Michael hit the lights and I was surprised how clean and refreshed he looked at the end of his shift. He said he would have been earlier but he'd been bathing in the restaurant's triple sink. He asked if I wanted to take a bath too, but I couldn't help but think there's something wrong with getting naked in the kitchen sink of Domino's. Michael made two separate cots from pizza bags for each of us to sleep on. We turned on the radio and threw some hot wings in the oven. I felt much safer sleeping in Domino's Pizza than I did in our scummy motel. It was the best sleep I had since we got kicked out of Hyde Park. The next day, Michael and I were up at dawn. It was the 4th of July and I had to get out of the pizza place before his manager showed up. Michael had to get the place cleaned up and ready for business. He hadn't had his morning coffee and he was yelling at me to leave. After waking up next to Michael in a bad mood, I realized I need something a little more suitable than that casual night on a pizza parlor floor. So I grabbed a copy of the paper and searched the classified section for a room to rent. I called an ad that was nearby and asked to look at the place. The guy on the phone said he needed someone right away. It wasn't far and it didn't have anything else to do for the holiday. When I got there, I met a soft-spoken short guy who most people would consider weird. His name was Patrick, and he was an engineer who graduated from UT a decade earlier. UT was just about the only thing we had in common. Patrick wanted more money than I had, but he agreed to work out a payment plan with me and let me move in, let me move in right away. I tried to convince Michael to rent out the other room, but he said he was having too much fun sleeping at Domino's Pizza. The house was in the southwest suburbs where all the cars and people pretty much look the same. Not many Key Boston weird bumper stickers, college students or artists around the area. It was 20 miles from campus, but there was a shuttle bus I could ride for free with my UT ID. I moved Sam over a week later and was thrilled to have a place for me and my cat before the semester started. I wasn't thrilled, I was happy. Four Wells, five rules. I paid three months rent and quit working at 7-Eleven. The semester was about to begin and I was going to get another financial aid check. Working at 7-Eleven while I was trying to graduate from one of the country's toughest journalism schools wouldn't have been a good, wouldn't have been a good idea. I was doing everything in my power to finish school, to put myself in a position where I didn't have to work low paying jobs like 7-Eleven. Patrick was a good roommate, but my cat didn't seem to like him. So he, I'm guessing he had a bunch of dark secrets that I didn't know about. The guy worked a lot, went on vacations, and basically stayed out of my way the entire three years I lived there. He had a big kitchen where I watched TV and did homework. Living in a suburban house with an old school home phone made me feel like a kid again. I pretended I had to study, work on projects, and do homework every evening. I'd take my backpack off, throw it on the kitchen table, and yell, I'm home. When my money ran out mid-semester, mid I found a part-time job as a dishwasher in a sorority in West Campus. The job had been vacant for months. It was for a current UT student, but there weren't many kids willing to take that kind of work. I, however, was exactly what they were looking for. I was a student, I was poor, and I could get my hands dirty. It was the easiest dishwashing job I have ever had, and I've had over a dozen. 
There were only about 50 girls living in the house, and my job was to wash their dishes for lunch and dinner. Not every girl ate, so I had about 60 plates to clean during a five-hour shift. I finished the dishes in an hour, and the rest of the time the house mother had to find things to keep me busy. The only part of the job I didn't like was being called a houseboy and dealing with the frat boys that come over to do the same cleanup as me. The only difference was that I actually got paid while they were volunteers whose parents paid so they could have the privilege of sweeping floors and scrubbing spaghetti off spoiled kids' plates. Not, none of the sorority girls knew that I went to the school of their, <clears throat> went to school at their precious UT, and I remember a, a conversation I had with a high-pitched valley girl a few days after I started working there. So, you're like the new dishwasher, she asked. Yes, I'm the dishwasher. So, do you like go from place to place washing dishes for a living? She said while laughing. No, I don't wash professionally. A few weeks later, the same girl spotted me on campus walking out of an advanced writing class. The expression on her face was priceless. I was the last person she'd expect to see leaving a classroom. I gave her a smile and her jaw quickly hit the floor. That summer, I got through one of the two courses I've been avoiding since I started college six years earlier, college algebra. College algebra was one of the weeding out courses you needed to pass for an upper echelon degree. <clears throat> I didn't have that option because I already met, oh, oh. that's okay, okay, most of, for an upper echelon degree. Most students took college algebra at ACC where it was easier. I didn't have that option because I already maxed out my ACC credits. So I did a little research. So I did my research and found an instructor who catered to people who didn't like math. It was a hard class to get into and there was always a waiting list, but I found a spot during that summer semester. The classroom was packed with students not majoring in math or science. The instructor was a pleasant looking blonde with large glasses. She dressed like an elementary school teacher in an outfit that had cartoon erasers, pencils, and yellow school buses on it. From the first day, she made everyone feel better about their chances of passing. The teacher took her time explaining everything, and if someone had a question, she didn't make them feel stupid. Somehow, she made understanding difficult concepts like calculus possible for non-math students. She even offered free study sessions and tutoring every weekday afternoon. I took advantage of all the free tutoring, did my homework, went to every class, and studied for every test. By the middle of the summer, I was solving complex geometry problems, graphing linear equations, and understanding the basics of calculus. I accomplished things in math I didn't think were possible. I easily passed, and now I just needed advanced Spanish to graduate. I registered for the final Spanish course during the fall of 2009 and would have graduated then, but other than the usual poverty, I had to deal with a tooth infection which caused my face to swell up like I was sucking on a baseball. It was literally the worst pain I ever experienced. I'm usually a trooper, but I had to miss a few classes. I didn't have money for a legal dentist, so Michael introduced me to a black market one from Costa Rica. Years of homelessness and neglect had led to a tooth to begin rotting out of my skull. My breath smells as if I'd been eating human feces or dead people. This was impossible for UT kids to understand, so I had to fix my tooth problem before it got in the way of me graduating. I remember smelling people with breath like that I, breath like that when I was younger, and I always wondered why their breath smelled so bad. Michael had been going to this pseudo dentist for about a year. He doesn't speak any English, and it kind of hurts, but you can't beat the price. The wannabe dentist operated out of a dirty garage and a dental chair straight from a set of little shop of horrors. His wife assisted by handing him each crude and rusty utensil he called out for. They were skimpy on the Novocaine, it was completely unsanitary, and the dude had no idea what I was talking about when I asked for antibiotics. I'd never been to dental school, but I know one of the first things they teach you is to not perform surgery on an infected tooth. I left the jerk's house and went straight to the University Health Services building where they gave me antibiotics and a lecture on illegal dentistry. A few years later, I heard on the news that him and his wife were arrested somewhere near Houston for unlicensed surgery. Toward the end of that semester, the UT admissions office told me I'd accumulated well over the 120 credits needed to graduate, so that spring was going to be my last semester, either way. I still hadn't graduated because I was missing the toughest class left for my degree. For the previous two semesters, I avoided fourth semester advanced Spanish. Instead, I filled my schedule with electives and history classes that didn't count for anything. I detested Spanish classes because I was so far behind. I didn't have it in high school like everyone else and went in not knowing much than the curse words I learned in county jail. 
My least favorite part was cooperative learning. Socializing and conversing with other UT students was obviously not my strong suit. They thought I was stupid, but they were ignorant to the fact that I didn't spend years studying Spanish like they had. While they were learning verb conjugation, I was selling weed and snoring cocaine. <clears throat> I got through the previous semester of Spanish, but I had to take it twice. It's not just because the material was hard, it was, but the first time I tried to take it, I also had that butch lesbian sitting behind me trying to put me down at every chance. I didn't fail, but I got the first D I ever received, and you needed at least a C to advance. I tried to register for three lighter courses during my last semester that wouldn't get in the way of Spanish. None of them counted toward my degree, so I tried to find classes that would help me in life. Sexual education was my least favorite experience at UT. I signed up for the class not knowing much about it, but I had overheard a girl talking overheard a girl talking about it while I was washing dishes at the sorority. She'd taken it the previous semester and was describing how fun the class was to another girl. Oh, it's like the last class you get to feel like a kid in, she said. The professor walks around the room joking with everyone, making fun of our clothes and our hairstyles. It's like high school, our last chance to be young before entering the real world, she proclaimed. The class had over a hundred students. Normally, I'd like a large class where I could sit in the back and not socialize. But this one had all the desks in a circle. There was nowhere to hide. The instructor was a short old guy from the East Coast with a high-pitched voice. He'd walk around the room making unfunny childish comments about how everyone looked. I was the only one he didn't openly make fun of. He just walked by my desk with a look on his face like he was eating sour candy. I guess it wouldn't have been funny to make fun of my clothes since I was the only obvious poor person. It's unsettling to be treated like a child when you're 30. Somebody would ask if they could go to the bathroom and he'd say, I don't know, can you? He'd ask us how we were doing and scold us if we said good. Good is an adjective, he'd scream. You can't feel good. I still disagree with that. <laughs> he would make conversations with the more well-dressed students in the class and created pet names for his favorites. There was the architect, which one frat boy was prestigiously called. Then there was the officer, another spoiled ego who wanted everyone to know he was joining the military. I was dubbed the guy who never laughs, or sometimes as the guy who never says anything. Things, would, things wouldn't have, uh, th it wouldn't have been so bad if some of the people didn't make such a big deal about me. The Valley's girl description of sex end was dead on. When I walked in on the first day, a few jaws hit the floor. I was used to it by now, but this class had one particular frat boy who stared at me way too long until it was off the charts, awkward and uncomfortable. Young girls stare at me in a non-threatening, flattering kind of way. But a woman, but but a but a frat boy, I should say women stare at me. Women stare at me in a, in a non-threatening flat. Most women, most women stare at me in a non-threatening, in a non-threatening, flattering kind of way. But a frat boy stares at me much differently. An overweight frat boy stares at me the way the guards stare at the prisoners at Auschwitz. On the first day of sex ed, I found a seat and looked up, noticing a few young girls looking at me looking at me with googly eyes. Then I saw a few dudes give me the usual dirty glares. They let me see their disdain before looking away. But there was one guy, the architect, who kept his eyes on me. He was sitting on the opposite end of the room, staring directly at me, not moving his eyes, not even for a second. I ignored him and got out my notebook, but I could still feel his menacing glare. I shook his, my head, rolled my eyes, and went back to look for a pen. I figured by the time I found one, there'd be no way he'd still be looking at me. He couldn't be that messed up, but when I looked up, there he was, beaming his ass off. He'd gone too far, and I'd gotten, and I'd had to end this guy's obsession, so I raised my eyebrows, lifted my arms, stuck out my palms, and was like, Hey, jerk machine, what's your problem? If somebody stares at you for 90% of the time, it means they either want to kill you or have sex with you. I'm pretty sure the architect didn't want to have sex with me, so I'm guessing the sociopath wanted me dead, even though I'd never seen him before. Finally, he looked away, and the instructor began his lecture. During that first class, I had to listen to jerks brag about their sexual conquests at UT. One fat guy claimed he'd had over a dozen girls give him rim jobs. It's pretty horrible to talk about that kind of stuff in school, but it's worse knowing that there are women out there who licked his asshole. At the end of that first class period, when everyone started gathering their things to leave, the architect started staring me down again, but this time it was intermittently. As he was clearing his deck, he desks, he'd look at me, then at the professor, then back at me again, then back at the professor. It didn't bother me anymore. The class was over and I was leaving. I noticed him whispering to the professor after class and, find, and found it odd that he was pointing toward me. But even then, I figured the last thing they'd be talking about would be me. 
However, apparently that spoiled kid had gone to the instructor after class and told him that I was staring at him and making him feel uncomfortable. I know this because the instructor brought it up at the beginning of the next class in front of all 100 plus students. Just because someone is looking at you doesn't mean they want to have sex with you. It doesn't mean they're coming on to you or they want to fight you, he said as he stood directly next to the architect who was sitting, like he was protecting him, as he looked across the large auditorium, obviously directing his comments toward me. I couldn't believe it. That kid wasn't special. He wasn't half the man I am, and he knew he wasn't. That was his problem. I don't think anyone was that low. I wasn't staring at him and wouldn't even have noticed the asshole if he didn't stare me down just for showing up. Maybe he thought I was going to complain to the instructor and he wanted to beat me to him. Beat me to him. I'll never get over how pathetic and unmanly a move that was of him. Toward the middle of the semester, there was a lecture about twins. At the beginning of it, the instructor asked if anyone in the room was a twin. I didn't want to raise my hand and I hesitated for a sec, but then I thought about mom and I knew she'd be rolling in her grave if I didn't. Is anyone in here a twin? The instructor asked. Anyone at all? I raised my hand and the old man bolted toward me, acting overly excited. It was probably, t probably the first time he ran anywhere in decades. You? Guy who doesn't say anything? You're a twin? The way he stressed the word you was like he was implying that I wasn't good enough, dressed well enough, or worthy enough to be a twin. Yes, I'm a twin, and I have two sisters that are twins too. A few girls in the class gasped, so the professor tried to cut me down to keep anyone from getting excited or being impressed. Do you even know if your twin's a girl or a boy? He asked me. What? I said. Yeah, he's my brother. Well, are you fraternal or identical? He asked. We're fraternal. Our sisters are too. What? That's nothing, he said. Nothing more than brothers. I tried to bite my tongue like I did a dozen times before, but this took too much out of me. And I, and I stayed up late thinking about it. I got up in the middle of the night and did the math. I realized I could fail every class that semester except Spanish and still graduate. I never went back to sex ed and got the first F of my life. I stopped going because it felt like unnecessary torture that wasn't ever going to help me graduate. It was in my best interest to concentrate on Spanish. I had one chance. If I came up short, I would have wasted part of my life. I wouldn't have a college degree, and the only way I could keep myself going to UT would be if I paid that outrageous tuition myself. Whether I passed Spanish had a lot to do with logistics. I needed a course with mature enough students who weren't going to make a big deal of it about me. So I registered for the earliest class I could find. Figuring the majority of assholes who gave me a hard time would still be asleep. The only kids who register for a language class that early had to be people who were actually interested in getting credit for the course. I prayed to get a decent instructor. And I got lucky getting a laid back one from Monterey, Mexico. He was about Monterey, Mexico. He was about my age and didn't grow up privileged like most of, most of his students did. We became friends and smoked cigarettes in the outside patio before class. Nobody else in the class smoked, so it was something we shared. Another student tried to join us once. He brought his own cigarettes, but he didn't know how to inhale, so we showed him how while making fun of him a little bit. Over the course of the semester, while we smoked cigarettes, I told the professor about my life. I told him I dropped out of high school and didn't have as many years of Spanish as the other students in the class. I went to every class and I studied Spanish in as many different ways I could think of. I'd watch hours of Spanish YouTube videos, I practiced pronunciation in the mirror, and I forced myself to watch Spanish TV. By the time midterms came, I was borderline passing, so I asked the teacher if I could make a few Spanish videos for extra credit. He said he thought it was a great idea, and by the end of the semester, I made over 50 comical YouTube Spanish videos, all with terrible pronunciation. The Spanish instructor thought they were hilarious and promised to do everything he could to make sure I passed. For my final two months of school, I only had Spanish music blasting from my headphones. I made hundreds of flashcards, and every morning during my hour-long commute on the city bus, I'd listen to Spanish music while quickly, quickly going over that day's flashcards. I even registered for a non-credit evening continuing education Spanish course held on campus. I paid for it with my own money. The informal program was sponsored by the student union, and it catered to housewives, middle-class professionals, and people who graduated from UT years earlier. Current students got a major discount on courses, so I was surprised there was only one other UT student in the class. Coincidentally, the continuing education course was held in the exact same room I had my regular Spanish class in. It was the same room, but a totally different environment. My informal Spanish class reminded me of the good old days at ACC. It had a wide variety of people of different ages, income levels, and backgrounds. 
there was always a better vibe around people who were there to learn and better themselves. I thought I was going to have a nervous breakdown the week before my final exam. Everything that I'd done in college had led me to this point. Every class, every grade, and every test meant nothing if I didn't pass. I had flashcards in my pockets at all times. I went to sleep watching Spanish soap brothers, and I had Spanish notes written all over my house and on the soles of my shoe. I even tried to think in Spanish. One day, I was sitting on the back of a sitting city bus heading toward, heading, excuse me, heading toward school with my bright red New York Yankee cap on, slightly curved to one side. My bag, my pants were baggy, and my hair was short and blonde. I had scruff on my face and hadn't showered in a couple of days. I was listening to classic Spanish opera while vigorously going through that day's flashcards with intensity. I already had this particular deck memorized. While I was studying, I noticed a straggly looking homeless man begin to approach me. He started looking at me from, from the front of the bus, bus before slowly getting up and walking toward me. He never stopped looking in my direction. I figured he was going to ask me for some change, but apparently the man had something more profound to say. I tried to ignore him, but he was persistent and signaled me to take off my headphones. I put down my cards, took off my headphones, and gave the bum my complete attention. You, you, it, it's you, I know who you are, he excitedly asked. Who, I humored him. You're Eight Mile, you know, the rapper. He acted like I really was Eminem, maybe he thought I was. He reeked of booze and was carrying a ukulele. You know, the part where he's on the bus learning the rap, she said. He said the raps like it was some kind of secret language. Learning the raps. <laughs> yes, yes, I know the scene. Learning the raps, I told him. I was initially offended by his opinion and got off the bus upset. I wasn't a white rapper from Detroit. I wasn't listening to Eminem. I was listening to Spanish opera. Who did this guy see in me? Did he think I was poor? I was a University of Texas student, close to graduation. When I got to campus, I stood in front of the clock tower and looked around. It was during the middle of class change, and I took in the whole scene. And I took in the whole scene. There was a group of fraternity guys and sorority gir girls hanging out on the stairs in front of the tower. Everyone was smiling, laughing, and having a grand time. They were dressed fashionably in that season's clothes that I was too poor to even know the name of. Some jocks greeted each other with high fives and fist bumps. None of them looked in my direction, but they acted as if they were being watched with melodramatic facial expression and laughter. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. Every inch of pa every pastel polo shirt had been thought out. Every inch of every pastel polo shirt had been thought out to match their khaki shorts and designer sandals. I noticed how every hair on every head was impeccably combed, and I started to give myself more credit than before. I saw myself in a different light and realized that I had a harder road to UT than every other student there. There might have been a couple other high school dropouts out of 50,000 undergraduates, but none of them had to go through anything close to what I did to get there. Nobody deserved that piece of paper more than me. I dropped out of high school to sell newspaper subscriptions door to door. I sold newspaper subscriptions over the phone for three years. I had five previous newspaper routes with five different people in five different neighborhoods. I worked for the ACC newspaper, the Austin American Statesman, and I didn't make less than a B in every single journalism class they threw at me. I deserved a degree in journalism. It was my last opportunity, and I was not going to let it slip through my fingers. Success was my only option. If I failed, I would have spent the last seven years of my life going to school every day just so I could check a box that said some college on a minimum wage job application. After my experience with the man on the bus, I went straight to the fine arts library, pushing over an engineering nerd that was blocking the entrance. I checked out the Eight Mile soundtrack, and for the next week, I blasted Lose Yourself by Eminem every day. On the day of the exam, I could rap the entire song in Spanish. I was nervous before the test. I couldn't sleep and I was throwing up. I, pay, I prayed for health and safety. <clears throat> I'll, pr I'll pray for health and safety, but this was something different. When we got the results back later that day, I found out I passed and was cleared to graduate with a bachelor's of journalism degree from UT. When it came time to walk the stage, I didn't have money for a cap and gown and nobody to come see me anyway, so I didn't attend. It would have been nice to have heard my name called out and gotten some kind of recognition, but I knew I wouldn't have enjoyed myself anyways. 
Instead, I watched it via live webcast from the comforts of my bedroom. I got a multi-camera perspective of the entire ceremony and saw all the people I'd spent four years attending classes with. When the event ended and the screen went black, I lay on my bed and stared at the popcorn ceiling. I didn't get a phone call, a knock on the door, or a pat on the back. Nobody called out my name, there wasn't an applause, and I didn't get a single congratulations. I couldn't stop thinking about mom and how proud she would have been. Bam! Yeah, this is really, really good. This is my book, Gonzo Education, written by Gregory Brandt. The ending is like incredible right there. That's great. I, it took so long, hours and hours, to rewrite and redo that ending until I finally got it perfect. And a writer knows when you get the perfect line or the perfect sentence, it's like rain, a little drop of rain compared to a bolt of lightning. So yeah, you know, um, you don't find a book like this. You don't find a self-published book like this written as well as this. This book, it's written so well, you would have thought that Somebody spent thousands of hours working on it and had a degree in journalism from one of the top journalism schools. Oh, you do, you know. So, yeah, you don't find a book like this polished. That's the best word. Um, yeah, you can find it on Amazon right now. It's like five or six dollars. Uh, you can get it free on Kindle. Um, this is all right now, you know. Um, eventually, um, um, I'm expecting to get a decent, um, advanced, and regular. Uh, a traditional publishing contract with this book and the following two books. This is Gonzo Education. It's the first book in this three-part series of Gonzo books. The second book is Gonzo Graduation, and the third book is called Gonzo Oahu. And uh, the second book starts immediately where this book ends, right when I graduate from college. And I thought I knew something about uh, rough sleeping and homelessness. Oh, I knew enough to write a book, write a book about it. But um, I soon learn in the next coming books that I knew nothing about it but thanks for listening uh, get a copy of this yourself uh, check out the uh, uh, my other videos click the thumbs up and if, and, uh, if you enjoyed my reading of this go to the Amazon page and write something about it so I can get a regular book contract on this thanks again and have a nice day